So, uh, this is part two of this chapter two uh, from the Sociology, Sex, Gender, and Power class, uh, chapter two, which talks about the social construction of gender. So, because of the length of the many of, uh, PowerPoint slides that we have, so I decided to have a part two to this. So, uh, part two from chapter two, which talks about the ongoing role of the socialization process in which we talked about before, and then gender identity, and the key thing is an ongoing process. Uh, gender, as it stated, is a social, not no form of a natural phenomenon, meaning that it is learned. It is not just pop up out of the blue, it's not a, a natural phenomenon, but being is learned behavior socially. Now, though rooted in social institutions, as we just talked about before, gender is passed on through social learning and it is enacted through our gender roles. So, uh, let me blow it up a little bit, there we go. So, how do we learn these gender roles? I and mean, We talked about the process of the socialization process and how we are socialized through these gender roles, which I've met, you know, barely, uh, briefly mentioned in the first chapter. Uh, gender roles are learned through the process of socialization. It is through the socialization process that individuals acquire an identity, and it's based on the gender. Gender identity is an individual's specific definition of the self. Get into a little bit of George Herbert Mead, uh, the symbolic interaction of sociologists. It's based on that person's understanding of what it means to be a man or a woman. In other words, it's through the socialization process that's gender, again, it is socially constructed. So remember, it's an individual specific definition of a self, even though society has its understandings and it's reinforced through the social institution, but it's based on the understanding of what it means to be a man and a woman. Through gender socialization, there are different behaviors and then different attitudes are encouraged and discouraged in men and women. So if you think about that again, is that the behaviors and attitudes which society encourages, you're a man, you should think this way, you should behave a certain way, or as a woman, you should behave a certain way and you're supposed to think a certain way. And through this gender socialization, and again, through the uh, agents of civil uh, socialization, through the families, peers, the teacher, the media, even sports teams, and we talked about the religious groups, uh, all of these are agents of socialization which help to lead to gender socialization. And some people become more perfectly socialized than others. So therefore, in the eyes of when you're doing a socialization process, some people become more familiar with this so-called role of gender that a man or woman is supposed to play. However, others kind of defy and say, hey, there should be no certain role that I should have to play. So it depends on the individuals. However, but we're looking at it from a larger standpoint of society and in society and say, okay, this is how we socialize people. This is how you're supposed to act as a man and as a woman. And then some people adapt to it based upon the institutions and how they became socialized uh, as they were growing up. To some extent, we probably all resist the expectations society have of us. And remember, the key thing is the expectations society has of us. Our being unique stems in part from this resistance as well as from the variation of the social experiences that we have. So, of course, that we have our own uniqueness and at the same time, even though we have social experience, different things based upon the individual, uh, there is a form of resistance saying that, no, I'm the man, I'm not supposed to act. I don't have to act this way because I'm a woman. I don't supposed to have to act this way, even though society says this is how we're supposed to be. But at some point, going back to the women's movement, the women's like, hey, I know society doesn't want us to vote. However, it's our choice, and I believe we should. You know, so that is a form of resistance during the culture of back then, prior to the uh, rise of feminism and prior to women having the right to vote. So in that social experience that some people were raised up, but these ladies like, no, uh-uh. You know, this is not how we're going to have it continued. And although some of us conform other, more than others, and socialization acts as a powerful system of social control. So when we look at the social control, is the fact that in this society that existed more of a patriarchic society there is this social control and power saying hey this is where things are 
and this is how it should be. And because we have become socialized and it's because of because it became part of this so-called powerful system that they had, and any form of resistance would cause people to fall back and say, hey, no. And it brings anger and frustrations to people. So again, remember during the rise of feminism when ladies were trying to vote, the men were putting them in jail, locking them up, arresting them. But the ladies had this strength and to move forward and say, hey, we're going to make this social change despite what the social institutions have in place, despite what the gender roles as far as no, you're not supposed to defy the orders of our current society. But at the same time, the uniqueness and then that resistance and the different social experiences that these ladies had in this particular instance of the women's uh, right for the right to vote, the, it, it, part of the three waves of feminism was very important in the United States history and across the world. So what happens, for example, if, example, if you deviate from your expected gender role? So men, if they went across the social role that they're supposed to have amongst their peers, amongst the other people, they would be li most likely be presumed as this old school term of being soft. In indicative uh, of the link between gender expectations and expectations about sexual identity. Uh, so with this so-called role of being soft that, okay, you're not as masculine, you know, and, and it became a negative term, especially when I grew up in the 70s, and said, oh, you soft. You know, it's not so much when I perceive it, you know, uh, as the sexual preference. But when they say expectations of sexual identity, it gets a little bit further into what's considered, in my opinion, of what's considered masculine and feminine. So therefore, oh, you soft, and they got anger from men saying, you know what? No, I'm not soft. And then the same thing with women who they deviate expected roles for them. They labeled these so-called uh, labels of tomboys. Oh, she's a tomboy. I heard that a lot as I was growing up. She's a tomboy, meaning that she may have been more athletic. She may have been doing things that the boys were doing, so to say. And, and this is just a, a little, little girl just having fun. You know, I mean, she likes football. Why don't she want to play baseball? You know, she want to climb trees and do all the stuff that so-called that boys do. Uh, but then they label, oh, yeah, she's a tomboy. Or they'd be later, later, uh, labeled as being unladylike, which is a negative term in my eyes to be considered this is unladylike. And then it is great that from when I grew up in the 70s, and I'm sure prior to that, that these ladies who may have a liking to sports of these so-called tomboys or these so-called unladylike behavior, which may have been something deemed as masculine that boys do back then. But if you look at the powerful positions that these ladies have, even into sports, there's more ladies into coaching in the professional male professional leagues. So not only do we have the ladies who are in, in you know, the NWA, uh, NCAA women's college coaching and other sports where they're predominantly women's teams. However, we have women who are crossing over to being officials in, in basketball and referees and stuff and then football and then they get into coaching positions and maybe one day there'll be a, a woman's head coach in the NFL or in the NBA or Major League Baseball or hockey, something like that. So looking at some of the expectations of these ladies who's always liking the sports, you know, I say continue on what you like to do because I see a lot of uh, more female sports casters who are on these shows. And these ladies know about sports. And it's not like, okay, let's just throw a lady up there. These ladies know what they're doing and they like sports. And it's okay to be yourself. And I think as a pioneer, a lot of these ladies who have crossed over into more of these so-called historical male-dominated sports, into coaching, things like that, I think it's going to be continuing on in the future. The socialization process controls us in several ways. Now, the key thing it says it controls us, and it's a process. It gives us a definition of ourselves. Number two, it defines the external world and our place within it. Number three, it provides our definition of others and our relationship with them. And number four, it encourages and discourages acquisition of certain skills based upon the gender. So this is the way the socialization, according to the book, the uh, socialization process controls us. 
in these four ways be familiar with that of course you know it's more likely an exam question homophobia defined as the feared hatred of homosexuals homophobia is a key word in here it is a system of social control that encourages boys to act more masculine as a way of indicating that they are not gay or this form of language of saying they're soft. Scholars have shown that the homophobic teasing that is rampant among adolescent boys is not so much directed at boys who are gay, but rather is intended to make sure other boys conform to the expected gender roles. So when they say stuff and they and it's like back then as I grew up and I'm I'm glad that times have changed uh, currently that the roles have changed and everything's more socially acceptable as far as not so much of your sexual preference or who you want to date but this so-called masculinity role that you're supposed to play as a man has gone away. It's okay for you to be a young teenage boy and an adolescent boy who's not into sports and you're not this so-called over masculine young man. You're just being yourself. If you're into video games and they say, oh, well, no, you're supposed to be in sports. Are you supposed to be doing this? You're supposed to be doing that. No, it's good that you enjoy who you are and don't let no one's opinion of you change who you are. You know, and, and in this negativity, of course, going back in the day from years and years ago. But, you know, homophobia has been a problem and, and hopefully it would not be a problem more in the future. Homophobia thus enforces the social construction of gender by discouraging men from showing so-called feminine traits, such as being caring. These, remember, this is so-called feminine traits I got from the book, such as caring, nurturing, emotional expression, and gentleness. So this homophobia, according to the book, as it enforces the social construction of gender, it discourages men from acting in these so-called feminine traits. However, being as a father, you have to be caring, nurtural, emotion, expression, gentleness. I don't even know if that's just from being. This is not so-called feminine traits to me. I think it has always been rooted historically in the social roles that say, well, no, you're supposed to be tough. You got to do this. You got to do this. And if you act nurturing and caring, but as a parent, you have to have that male, a woman or male, you know, male, female, it doesn't matter to me. And I think this being that, because kids needs that. And, and a lot of times it's being a dad, especially if you have a daughter and, you know, you have to show some of those traits that you have. And even with your son, you know, you can't be this so-called over-masculine dude all this time because this child does need caring and nurturing from both parents. So it's not like, oh, that's the mother's job. She does that stuff. I don't do that. And mama's does that. No. Uh -uh. And I'm glad the times have changed because of the fact there are a lot of men. My little brother is... An example is a single dad taking care of two boys, and he has to play the role of being a provider and the so-called feminine traits, and he's done everything. He's a wonderful young man. He's taking care of two boys uh, at this by as a single dad by himself, working and taking care of the kids, and there are a lot of men who have these so-called feminine traits, which they're called in them. But I don't see it that way. I don't, you know, it's been historically called so-called feminine traits. But today, I think that a lot of men have to really not, you know, not follow that type of concept and just focus on being yourself and understanding that a child needs these not only from their mom, but from the father as well. Other examples of gender and social expectation, the cultural expectations associated with gender and beauty according to the cultural expectations. Body image, feeling they are never adequate. Uh, again, as, as I talked to my students before, uh, despite whatever the cultural expectations accord with gender and beauty, body image, love yourself and love who you are and it does not matter. Uh, back then it was a thing about, oh, she couldn't weigh this much or she has to be thin or she has to look this way, she has to look this way. And, and, and then certain people may feel bad about themselves because they do not fit the image of what the culture expectations are regarding beauty. And, and it's like a lot of these guys know we don't have six pack stomachs. No, and, and you know, but it's cool, okay because you're a guy and a woman should, nah, that's, that's, that's the best. 
That's nonsense. I, I look at the body image, you who you are. There are some ladies, if you 200 pounds, love it. Love you and love who you are because there's some men or, and, and ladies, whoever it may be, will love you for who you are. You don't have to change for nobody. You don't feel like, oh, I have to miss society's expectations and beauty. When you look in the mirror, that is the beauty that you see within yourself, no matter what. You don't have to change nothing that you change it for yourself. Nobody's in the culture of social expectations should allow you to change. And you feel good about yourself, your beauty. When you look in that mirror again, the beauty is you, who you see. And if someone else sees the same beauty, and a lot of other people do too. So never feel bad about who you are, this so-called body image, uh, what's being adequate. Hey, some people are going to love you for who you are. So continue to be yourself. If you want to change something, you do it for yourself, not because of what the culture expectation. Smoking, they said because they think it's cool. I think a lot of young people, I don't see them smoking cigarettes like they used to. I know they smoke them other things, uh, you know, but at the same time, it, it's just that, I think back then it was like, okay, it's a cool thing to smoke a cigarette. And I tried it one time and I, I think I was to cough for two hours. Like, oh no, I'm not doing it. I was in high school when I was young and I tried to smoke a cigarette because I thought it was cool back in, in the 80s, early 80s. And I never did that again. So I don't see a lot of young people. I know they vaping right now, but hopefully, you know, more education and research on vaping, looking for the safety reasons for that. But I think that that's just fit into the culture expectation of what's considered masculine and what looks cool with smoking cigarette. So as I continue, uh, kind of switch it up when we look at race and gender identities, intersectionality, uh, which the author of the book talks about, that teaches that gender does not exist in a vacuum. Uh, it overlaps with other important social factors. We look at race, ethnicity, age, ability status, social status, and a bunch of other things and to shape our social experience, relationships, and identities. Got more information on intersectionality. I look at the uh, Wikipedia's definition just to add stuff. So uh, intersectionality is an analytical framework for understanding how aspects of a person's social and political identities combine to create different modes of discrimination and privilege. Examples of these aspects are your gender, caste, sex, your race, class, sexuality, religion, disability, physical appearances, and height. Uh, and, and they look at the two different modes because you can experience intersectionality as a form of discrimination. And then they also mention about discrimination, I mean, uh, intersexuality as a form of a privilege. So you have it both ways. Someone can feel discriminated against because of the intersectionality, which you have a combination of Discrimination is based upon gender, based upon race, based upon sex, based upon your sexuality, physical appearance, things like that. But then some maybe have a privilege based upon their race, their gender, their sex, their sexuality, anything. So it kind of goes into that a little bit. It identifies multiple factors, advantages, and disadvantages. These intersecting, which is overlapping social identities, may both be empowering and oppression. So someone may benefit from it, these intersecting uh, inter intersectionality, but some people can be have it as a disadvantage and then become a form of oppression. One thing about gender, as we go through, and we'll talk about intersectionality later in other chapters. This is only early part two, chapter two, so it's still kind of early, but we have a bunch of other chapters to go. When we think about the life course, I like for a lot of young people to think about the life course, you know, and as it creeped up on me as my age at 50 years old, I look back, man, I tell students, I remember when I was 18 years old, I remember I was in high school, being 50 is not just a magical age that pops up. All of us that were 50, I know we considered as old people, and as my student would say, you know, you're about 50, you got one foot in the grave and the other one not, you know what I'm saying? I say, okay, I accept that, but I'm a cool 50. You know, but I, I think about through the life course and I think about my age when I was 18 and it seemed like yesterday. And I look at 19 and my 20s, my 30s, my 40s, and even up to 50. I think and I tell young people, 18, 17, 18, up until your 30 is the most crucial point in your life, in my opinion. And when they say, I know some of you are a lot of young people, when they say life begins at 40, I didn't believe it until I turned 40. 
But I always heard it when I was growing up. Life begins at 40. And it does. And 50 is even cooler. You know, so... But when we look at gender identity, it becomes established very early in one's life and continues as a people move through their life course. When we encounter new social experiences, key word, well, you're going to reach new social experiences. And like I say, I remember my 20s, 30s, and 40s. We adapt new roles and identities as the expectations of others around us evolve. Now, remember that the social, the social roles and the culture have changed since the 1970s, since the 1960s. Things are so much different now with, you know, people, gender identity has been so much socially accepted. I mean, there may be some few say, oh, I don't, you know, man's supposed to be like this. And, you know, that's nothing to do with your sexual preference, but this so-called gender identity. Oh, you're a man. He's a boy. He's supposed to do this, and I got to do this. And there's that old school values that some granddaddies and daddies have, and them uncles and them still have that perception. Even the mamas and aunties and grandmamas have that perception. Oh, he's a boy. He's supposed to do this, you know. But it's going to change because you're looking for young people in the early 18s and 20s and your 30s and your 40s. So much is going to change. You just even look at technology. Look how the cultural, uh, uh, the social roles have changed over the years. You know, so it just remembers as, as you get older, you will encounter new social experiences. You're going to adapt to these new roles and identities and expectations of others. You know, it's going to evolve. The formation of gender is critical in the childhood, but it does not stop there. We will see below the life course categories. So the key thing, as y'all know me, I'm big on words. I look at words and say formation of gender, and it is critical in your childhood. It doesn't stop there. So think about, you know, some of y'all a lot younger, childhood, you're 18, 17, 19, that's, that was a few years ago, according to me. But you got somebody like me looking back, man, 1972, 1974, when I was a little kid. And our life course categories, we look at being an infant, childhood playing games, schools, sports, and socialization, and then adult socialization and aging. So remember, as I talked about in chapter one, we've been an infant, girls in pink, boys in blue. And I kind of briefly mentioned it back in chapter one because I just want to pull you in to getting the understanding of how society has socialized us into our gender roles. And when they socialize us into our gender roles, it, it, it becomes a fact that it is a system that is in place and it is going to continue on even as we raise kids. So beginning as an infant, boys and girls are treated differently based on gender, of course. Research on infant socialization shows how quickly gender expectations become part of our experience. Something as simple as a birth announcement, you all call it gender, ID, you know, gender identity parties, can start gender messages early. Remember they got, you know, some people I went out and they had the big balloon and they bust the balloon and there's uh, pink confetti come out, we got a girl. Blue confetti come out, wow, it's a boy. People jumping around like, well, you know, automatically we assume it's a girl, boy, just on the colors. So if they bust out this, this confetti and this pink, and everybody like, oh, congratulations, you got a girl. They said, no, we got a boy. They said, but everything's pink. Why is it pink? That's the sign of a girl, but no, it's a boy. And it gets confusion right there. Why would you do that? You know, boys don't have pink. You know, you know. And then as they come, there, there, there is that social uh, role of gender socialization that is already in place. So you don't even have to even say what the announcement is. If you have a boy or girl, when you see that color pink, it's a girl. When you see that color blue, it's a boy. If you reverse it around and say, oh, you got blue confetti. Congratulations on having a boy. Like, no, it's a girl. People are going to question that. A research analysis of greeting cards has found that the vast majority are gender stereotyped. And again, that's to do socialization. Research shows in one lab study, although the infant's behaviors did not differ from boys and girls, mothers, they stated, and this is research, this is not me, this is research. At the top, you see research shows. They actually did a lab study. Mothers engaged in more conversation with the infant daughters and more likely to give instructions to their sons. Now, 
they say this may be unintentional, but it has an effect on later life, nonetheless. If you think about it, and just for your own purpose, just think about that, you know. As a parent, did my mom, you know, give me more instructions because I was a son? Because they looked at the mothers with their daughters, were they giving them more conversation? It's just interesting, but they actually did research and always respect people's research, say what they've done. Uh, but just kind of keep that in mind. They say it may be unintentional, but it does have an effect later on in life. Uh, they say, have you ever wondered how this culture behavior was established? Pink and blue emerged as gender markers in the 1950s, way before my mama said y'all was even thought of. The, before me too, I was born 1970. The identification of pink for girls and blue for boys did not become firmly established until the 1960s. People didn't start dressing babies differently until the 20th century. Before then, babies and children's clothing were all mostly in neutral colors. White dresses that both boys and girls wore until they reached a certain age, and when boys would then wear pants. Why maintain the gender colors, at least in the U.S.? Scholars explain is the result of mass marketing and mass consumption. Color clothing, and, I, and they say I underline mass marketing and mass consumption. Now, color clothing makes it harder for parents to hand down clothing from one child to the next, resulting in the need to buy more clothes. Now you get into the business aspect. Although the emergence of psych, 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 uh, child psychology experts and their influence on parents created a culture where parents started to think that it was important to distinguish between boys and girls. Now, we go into childhood playing games, and this is very important. Through play, children learn the skills of social interaction. Kind of get to the George Herbert Mead. Uh, think about what kids, little kids play, and they have a hell of an imagination. They may have this imaginary friend. They, they got a whole little conversation going on with this little dog, with this stuffed animal. And they got a whole name and everything for the, for the, the baby and the stuff, Adam, I remember this little girl was playing with a doll, and I'm sitting there trying to play with her. I said, what's the baby's name? She said, baby. I said, she, you guess, that's her name? She's like, yeah. I said, you didn't give her, like, a regular name? She's like, no, I just call her baby. Her name baby. So okay. So she began to tell me about the baby and how she, the baby's not eating, how she's going to feed the baby. And I'm like, I'm just sitting there chilling because you got to play with the kids. It's always fun interact, interacting with the kids. Uh, especially as they develop this cognitive and analytical abilities, and then they are taught the values and attitudes of their cultures through childhood playing games. Now, the games that children play have great significance for their intellectual, moral, personal, and social development, as well as for, they say, their gendered identity. Uh, getting here is George Sherman Mead. He's considered a social psychologist, and, he, and to me he's a major sociological theorist. Uh, he described the three stages in which the socialization occurs. Now, I talk about this more in my intro class, intro to sociology class, and if you look at my PowerPoint video, there's a little bit more information about George Herbert Mead. Uh, he looks at imitation, play and game. Because remember, I'm going to go through these three stages of uh, childhood playing games with George Herbert Mead. Imitation stage, now, you know, an imitation, infant simply just copies the behavior of a significant person in his or her environment. So if you watch a baby, they're going to do what you do. You know, a lot of babies don't know nothing. They're just looking at you, they're learning, they're observing, they're watching. A lot of times babies watch your eyes, they watch your mouth. They're just watching and observing. Very smart. You know, and they're going to copy what they see. So I tell people, try not to curse around babies because then the baby's going to start cursing too. Uh, you know, but just the baby's going to watch. So, I, you know, what you do and based upon his or her environment. Now, the play stage is a child begins to take the role of the other person. And at that point, they develop, they see himself or herself from the perspective of another person. So they use the example of playing mommy or playing daddy. So they're watching the mom, they're watching the dad, and they're saying, this is the role of mom, this is the role of dad. And then they may imitate. So the little girl might put on the, you know, the mom's hat, her jewelry, her necklace, her purse, her shoes, and because this is what she's observing. She's taking a role of the other person. Or a young man may put on a dad's hat, put a tie on, and, you know, put on dad's shoes, may even carry dad's briefcases, something like that. Because remember, this is a stage where they're learning. You know, think back when you were a kid. This is a process of learning. 
uh, from the perspective of another person. The game stage. Children able to do a little bit more rather than seeing themselves from the perspective of only one significant other. Mother, father, you even look at the siblings. My little brother used to watch me, my little sister used to watch me as well and learn your grandparents and stuff like that. At a time, children can play games requiring them to understand how several other people, including more than just significant others, view things them uh, simultaneously. So as you play games, I look at even sports, uh, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, but the game stage is even just me, you know, playing board games. I know I had learned at an early age how to play checkers and, ch and uh, chess, which I was constant. My father taught me, and I had to learn, you know, the different roles, and I'm watching his move at chess. And I'm thinking like, okay, what is he about to do? You know, and I'm, you know, and, and then I'm watching what he did and how his moves and how I'm going to counteract. And, you know, it's a lot of times I have to learn this particular game of chess because it was more thinking, but it was more anticipating. And it helped develop more of a social skill for me because now I'm looking at what the other person is doing based upon not just me, but the people around me. In 2012, uh, Aaron made history by becoming the first woman to play football as a quarterback in a Florida high school. This would only have been unimaginable, they said, not that many years ago. And then he asked the question, you ever think we'll see a woman playing in the NFL? According to the book, what would it take for this to happen? Of course, we see the NFL coaches, but we're not sure how this goes. But this young lady was in 2012. Uh, she actually played football as a quarterback in a Florida high school. And I remember... Uh, they had the uh, the tournament. It was the World Little World Series, little kids, and when um, Chicago was really big, and they had this young girl who I think she was from Philadelphia. This is when um, Jackie Robinson had won the for the uh, United States, and then they went on and played overseas. But there was this young girl. I think she was from Philadelphia, and this young lady was the pitcher, and she was striking them out. She was killing them. You all can Google and look it up. I forgot this young lady's name, but she played and she was pitching as she was throwing down. Wasn't intimidating. Wasn't like, you know, old school. Well, she throws like a girl. This time it's a compliment. When you say, oh, she throw like a girl, that girl was pitching and she was throwing and she was striking them out. And this young lady was, you know, very, you know, very impressionable, you know, which was great for her to play the sport. But, you know, she had an arm on her. She, she, was, she was doing it. Research shows that the pervasiveness of gender stereotype at is as learned in early child playhood as I talked about before in chapter one. The toys and play activities that parents select for children are a significant source of gender socialization. Researchers also find out that middle class girls, they're not even looking at social class according to the book, with the research part that middle class girls are more likely than working class girls to play using domestic themes such as brides, cooking, and dolls. In general, boys also spend more time with male stereotype toys, where girls are somewhat more likely to play with both male stereotype and female stereotype toys. And I remember as we talked before that if it was reversed and the boys were to play with the so-called female stereotype toys, then all hell can break loose. Like, boy, put that doll down. What you doing? Put their kitchenette set down, you know. And of course, young men, they can they gonna be fathers one day. They need to know how to change diapers. They need to know how to take care of feed a baby. They need to know what they wear around the kitchen, know how to cook. You know, and that's part of the thing. It's not just that woman's job, so to say. So men, yes, these little boys should be knowing how to wash dishes, as my mother taught me. Get in there, wash dishes, how to go in there and cook. You know, I also had a little brother and little sister when I was 18 years old. I had to watch them, and I wanted to watch them. I wanted to learn. I had to change the diapers and everything. So it's not just, okay, here, you take her. You take the baby. No, you as a man, just as you're a child or even a younger sibling, boys can do this. So therefore, but the old school pattern is, is just all hell's going to break loose if this boy got a baby doll in his hand. Oh, no, 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 no. Not masculine. Childhood playing games, children themselves impart gender expectations to each other. Young people are also bombarded with gender images from books, video games, television, and social media. Even with a greater awareness of society of gender stereotypes, 
advertisers still perpetuate gender stereotypes that have an influence on young children. So remember, as in the beginning of chapter one, I talked briefly about the gender socialization, but then we look at how the video games, you know, there were less uh, female characters early out when the video games first came out. So the young girls had maybe one or two characters to choose from. And I think in the movie, I think it was Street Fighter, it was maybe one or two girls. And young girls might want their own, you know, character to be able to play on a video game. They had to choose the boys. They may not want to choose a boy. They may want to choose a girl. You know, Tomb Raider came out, which was very big because there was a female character in there uh, throughout the whole video game. So it wasn't just a male-dominated game, sort of say. I'm not too big on video games. I don't know how it's going on right now. Uh, I, you know, I had to... Don't care too much for the, uh, I forgot the name of that. Um, but it's the video game where you walk around and you carjack people and you do all this other, you shoot people and stuff like that. I forgot the name of that one. But I'm not a real video video game person. Uh, television, of course, there are so-called movies that, you know, may be so-called catered towards men and catered towards women. And therefore, just like if a guy sit back with his boys and say, hey, man, let's watch The Notebook together. You know, guys like, well, that's a love story. We're not watching that, man. Let's watch the game. And, no, man, we're going to watch the, look, the, the Notebook. Great movie. However, it's a bunch of guys, guys night, so to say, instead of us watching football, we're going to watch this. Sometimes it's unlikely, depending on the group of men, you know. But however, sometimes it's become a gendered image of watching so-called masculine shows. I know for me and the guys, I can speak from my own personal experience. I don't know about everybody else. But from my own personal experience, it was like the guys get together, we watch the sports. Social media is something huge. I'm not too much big on social media, but if you look into it, you can see how uh, gendered images are being expressed in social media. Even with a greater awareness of society of gender stereotypes, the advertisers still perpetuate gender stereotypes that has an influence on young children. Childhood playing games. Childhood pop culture is also full of gender stereotypes. Um... Uh, the female characters are far more likely than male characters to be depicted with stereotype cues such as decorative clothing and to be sexually submissive, submissive uh, such as in revealing clothes. And I'm just going back to the video game Street Fight, uh, something like that where the ladies were less clothed and I'm sure there were other video games where they were like that. I'm not sure what they were. Uh, you know, in some forms of television and movies, uh, male characters are far more likely to be portrayed with their body in motion and with hyper-masculine accessories such as a weapon and things like that. But I love some of the movies where female was the female leads were the characters, Sigourney Reeve and Aliens. She was tough. I remember, uh, I forgot the guy's name. He was, uh, they were going through this tunnel and he just panicked and Sigourney Reeve just took over. You know, this guy didn't know what to do. His men was getting killed and she like, look, I'm taking over you know, and she was so much in charge and she was so much respected. Uh, Kill Bill, one of the classics. Uh, Salt was another good movie. It was a lot of great movies where females were the lead character who, you know, so-called uh, was not playing this submissive, sexually submissive role. But these ladies were just real, like, real badasses and, and, and they were just, you know, great characters. And I, I, I enjoyed it. It's not just the men who was in charge, but the ladies as well. In video games, like I said, I know little about it, but the art to talk about women are usually minor characters. Most of the visibly, highly visible figures in video games, of course, are men. That was back then. I don't know about now. So some of you gamers, don't get mad at me. I don't know. Uh, it'd be interesting in the conversations that I have in classrooms and as I get to learn from more young people and it'd be a discussion as how is the video games it, right now? Because I don't know. You know, my daughter's 12, 19 and I don't know what's, She's not so much into video games, but I don't know. I've got to talk to a couple of gamers and find out what's it's like. Um, women tend to be depicted in highly sexualized ways and more often victims and are generally cast in seemingly in innocent roles. Men, on the other hand, are seen as aggressive, muscular, highly capable, and frequently carrying weapons. Um, I like Rambo, like the Terminator as far as... Uh, and the Terminator, uh, I forgot the lady's name. Sarah Connor was was cool. She was she was wasn't no punk with playing with the Terminator. She wasn't scared of. Uh, and I like certain movies like that, which is cool as well. Give me the action, but at the same time, it's still fun to watch. 
Uh, these sources of socialization send powerful messages to young boys and girls, according to the book, Messages That Continue As People Grow Older. Schools, sports, and socialization, part of the um, agents of socialization. Schools in particular exercise much influence on the creation of engendered attitudes and behavior, so much that some researchers call learning, hidden, learning genders a hidden curriculum in quotes is the in the schools according to the book school curriculum the materials the teacher expectations educational tracking and peer relations encourage girls and boys to learn gender related skills and self concepts uh, remember i was in auto shop high school young lady walking there trying to take a class and all the guys look at her like because it's usually all the guys up in there for girl coming in they like what was she doing here you know so, and I've, and I've learned since I was in high school, because I graduated from high school in 1988, so from 84 to 88, I was in high school. So imagine, you know, the culture has changed, like, like you know, and there's more home ec classes, as my students told me. And I, and I still need to know more about, the, especially the curriculum in high school and grammar school, where they have more curriculum of home economics and other different courses, which teaching the boys, and it's not just a all-girls class, and this is not just an all-boys class. Differences, school sports and socialization, the difference between boys, boys and girls become exaggerated through practice that divide them into distinct human groups, according to the book. Example, children often seated in separate gender groups are sorted into play groups based on gender. Now, I do remember this when I was a kid. I'm sure it's changed, and so for you all, uh, as I call millennial young people, uh, and it's more like have changed, but I remember back then, uh, we were seated in the, here's the boys, here's the girls. We was always sorted, the boys over here and the girls over here. You know, and I'm sure it's changed and I have continue to want to continue discussions in class and learn more about the, the gender, uh, how gender is being portrayed in the schools, especially in the playgroups currently today. These gender typical behaviors have consequences for what how children learn in school. Uh, boys and girls in a school with roughly equal abilities by the time they leave high school, clear gender differences in their future plans emerge. Not all the cases, but this is what the author points out in her book, that once they leave high school, gender differences in their, their future plans do emerge based upon when they leave high school. So women in STEM fields, that's considered science, S-T-E-M, science, technology, engineering, and math. In the early years of school, girls report like in math and they match or exceeded boys in their math abilities. I remember in high school, I didn't know that stuff, so I talked to the young ladies and said, hey, how did you do this homework? Wasn't a math person, but I'm glad I had some of the other ladies that helped help me out. Over time, girls report like in math and science less than boys and express little confidence in the math and science abilities, despite their good performance, which is according to the research from the author that she provided. Uh, this happens even though girls take math and science credits, they get higher grades and get roughly similar scores on advanced placements. Those who report like in math and science have a higher self-esteem and have higher career aspirations than other girls, according to the author. These patterns have profound effects on the extent of gender segregation in the labor market as young men and women become adults. Now, Title IX, a federal law passed in 1972 that prohibits sexual discrimination in federally funded education programs and activities. Schools' experiences for girls and women have been profoundly changed by this Title IX. Title IX also includes schools and sports, but it is also the basis for policies against sexual harassment. One major change stemming from Title IX has been far the greater participation of girls and women in sports. A dramatic trans uh, transformation from a time when rules and customs excluded women from athletics. When playing sports, even the youngest boys will be encouraged to be more aggressive and to play tough or perhaps deliver a violent hit. I know we was encouraged playing football. Hit them hard. That was the thing. Don't cry. No crying in football when we play football. And no whining and crying in football is what it told us. Walk it off. Tough it up. 
Like I say, we do that to our little boys sometimes, and some of us push the little boys. He hurt. Oh, man, you be all right. Run it off. Run it off. So I always tell us, run it off. We take a job. Like I said, the kid could have internal bleeding. They didn't care. They just like, shake it off. Run it off. Let the girls, like I said, it's a little bit different. You're like, oh, hopefully she's okay, more nurturing. But back then, I don't know about now, but back then, we were considered to play tough. These early messages associated sports with masculinity so much that girls who are aggressive and tough in their play might be discouraged from being so or being risk labeled as a boy from back then. I remember back when I was in grammar school, uh, Shirley Jean, uh, when I was in uh, Roseland, Shirley Jean would go out there and play with the boys. And Yolanda Griffith used to play with us. And Yolanda Griffith, of course, went on to be uh, a, a star in the WNBA. So if you Google Yolanda Griffith, WNBA, me and her grew up together right there on, uh, on the block 116th from Lafayette at uh, Scanlon Basketball Course, Scanlon Elementary School. She was out there playing, and, and Yolanda Griffith, we played her like, you know, rough as well. She played rough too. And it was just enlightening to see Yolanda Griffith to go on to be a star of the WNBA uh, and knowing that was my friend from, from grammar school. And she would be out there playing, and the Shirley Jean used to be out there playing better than the guys. We used to pick teams, man. I got Shirley Jean. <laughs> I got Yolanda. Yolanda was tall, and she played some ball. She can shoot past the ball to her. She going for a layup. She can play some ball. Additional examples, there are clear hierarchies of gender and sports institutions. Of course, there are more male coaches. They get the high salaries for men and simply more opportunities for men. In sports narratives, women are either invisible or described not just for their athletic ability, but also for their looks. And I think that was one of the things uh, when it has some of these sports uh, casters that are ladies and, you know, guys like, oh, she's cute, you know, okay. But she know her stuff, though. She know her sports, too. So I've heard guys say, man, who is that pretty girl sitting back doing sports? You know, and, and but these young ladies, to me, you know, they they knew sports. And I can just sit back and relate to them. And I sit back and watch ESPN, and uh, I think it's Jalen Rose's wife, and she talks about sports and his other ladies. And I, I just kind of see it's just conversations on sports, you know, what I like to just hear and, and the different perspectives from all the men and women on sports. More example, women's sports, if reported at all, are seldom the headliners in the sports sections of the media. Uh, you can see how gender is constructed by studying the titles of sports teams. Men are warriors. Women names are more uh, diminutive. And, and women athletes, especially women of color, are often sexualized by broadcasters in ways that men are not. Um, you know, it, it, I don't really hear too much of that. I mean, I'm sure it does exist. Um, however, at the same time, you know, when I hear negativity from broadcasters, I just tune them out or I just put the mute button on. You know, and I look at the sports teams and, and this, the, the title, which the author points out, that the when they sell them the headliners in the sports sections of the media. And as I talk in class about this, that when we look at the so-called greatest of all time, remember, Jordan... Uh, to me, my favorite basketball player is Michael Jordan. I grew up at that time, and people talk about LeBron versus Jordan, and there's Kobe Bryant, who's a GOAT, and they look at sports, football. I'm a Terry Bradshaw fan. Terry Bradshaw undefeated in the Super Bowl. I think he won five of them undefeated in the Super Bowl. And people say, oh, Tom Brady, he got all these rings, and then he look into baseball, and who's the GOAT? But then again, like I said, again, I like the fact ESPN reported all the success that Venus Williams had with all the trophies and, and accomplishments she has made. And like, again, you put all them trophies up there together and Venus has got more than everybody. Venus is, is you know, we say in the sport, she's a beast out on that tennis court. You know, and, and, and for, that's something, that's that's her thing. She, she's, when they say men are warriors, uh, when they're on the sports titles and stuff, and sp studying sports teams, you look at, Venus and even Serena and some of them other young ladies. I think they can get them in and go for their game. I mean, I'm not going up against her. I know I can't do it. I'm going to get embarrassed out there. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, we look at some of the ladies who have great accomplishments. Like a friend of mine um, who, Yolanda Griffin in the WNBA, and, and she was beating guys from the basketball court in grammar school. She was winning 20, the game of 21. She was winning them games. You know, and I'm like, man, Yolanda's out there killing us. She was beating guys in one-on-one -on -one games. 
you know, and they played her rough, and she played rough right there. So it just, not only we need to look at, you know, when you put the GOAT conversation, just add in Venus Williams, because she's great as well. Although our gender identities are established early in life, changes in our status in society, for example, when we graduation, marriage, a new job, brings new expectations for our behaviors and beliefs. As we encounter new experiences throughout our lives, we learn the role expectations associated with our new status. So if we go back to the socialization um, in my intro class is that you occupy a status, but you play a role. So when you go into your statuses in a society, there's a role that come with it. And the statuses may be, for instance, myself, I became a father, and there's a role expectation that come with being a father, being a husband when I was married. Uh, you know, there, there's a status that's going to be changing throughout your life. So as younger people and as you all get older, you're going to have these new experiences throughout your life. And you're going to learn a role, especially through the new status. So remember, you occupy status, but you play a role according to that status. As a social experience, aging has different consequences for men and women. For all older people, good health, being embedded in relationships and the support of community are important indicators of quality of older people's lives. So when you get older a little bit, things change. Start, you know, gotta get healthy, stay eating healthy. You've been in relationships and got a support system, support community. You know, male or female, that's just part of the life of being an older person. Cross culture evidence shows that aging is less stressful for women, for women in societies. Cross culture, according to the book. When there are strong ties to family and kin, not just to a husband. Where there are extended family systems, where there is a positive role for mother-in-laws, rather than the degraded status attached to our society. People talk about their mother-in-law, oh, my mother-in-law. You know, and at the same time, it's, there was this negative role, but nah, a lot of mother-in-laws are real cool. And where there are strong mother-child relationships throughout the life. Gender differences in the social process of aging can be attributed in large part to the emphasis on youth found in this culture, and in particular to the association of youth and sexuality in women. Cultural stereotypes portray older men as distinguished, and I don't believe this, older women are less desirable. There's some fine older women out there. So uh, and even when I was younger, I said, man, there's some fine older women. So there's this... And you see the key words, it's a cultural stereotype, stereotype and it's portrayed. That was a portrayal. Guy, what do they call him? Silver Fox, the men got gray in their hair. It's a distinguished look uh, that they got. What's that guy, Mr. Steele, your grandmama, they called him? Uh, the older guy, he got gray in his hair. And they said, oh, he's seasoned. He's distinguished. Uh, it's sexy about that, they say, you know, and the old women, you know, I don't see it as less desirable. You can ask a lot of men and agree. There's a lot of older ladies still looking great in their fifties and their sixties. They still look great in their forties. So, uh, I, I, I know, and this is, and this is just a cultural stereotype, you know. And this is just a historical piece where the men become more distinguished and the women are not. But things have changed around, and, and we see each other in the older people category. I can see us as older men and women. We are not just less desirable, you know. Some of us still got it going on. So, uh oh, that is it. That's all I have for this particular chapter, uh, chapter two. So, I will be talking about the next chapter. So, as we continue on through these conversations, so uh, continue.